Hey guys, welcome to another video. We're going back in time 30 years and checking out these two Sound Blaster sound cards. So we will listen to some games, check out the features and the differences between these two cards. They're both called Sound Blaster, but there are slight differences. We put together a 386 retro gaming PC and I will also spend a few minutes talking about this system. So yeah, let's go back in time and enjoy some happy gaming memories. In the late 1980s and early 1990s, there were heaps of sound card standards floating around, but the Creative Labs Sound Blaster managed to become the de facto standard. So firstly, it achieved this by being compatible with the AdLib standard. Here we have the Yamaha OPL2. The Sound Blaster was also compatible with Creative Labs previous sound card, the Game Blaster or Creative Music System and all you had to do was install a few chips here. And finally, the Sound Blaster was able to do digital voice effects and speech. The track sequence is engaged. 15 minutes till detonation. I'm back. Indy? You don't look at all well, Dr. Charles. Exploring our collections can be dangerous, Mr. Uh, what was your name again? Smith. And it also came with a game port. So all in all, the Sound Blaster was compatible with a lot of standards. You got a game port and the whole card was priced fairly competitive. And I believe that is the reason why the Sound Blaster became so successful. So this is the Sound Blaster CT1320C and we had a look at this one in a previous video. Here's a date, 1990. This one is physically larger. It's compatible with AdLib, does Sound Blaster. You install these two Philips chips and you get Game Blaster compatibility and you've got a game port here. There's a volume dial to uh, control the volume of the headphone output. Um, in terms of pricing, I believe, yeah, these are not gonna be cheap. Prices have definitely gone up. I got all these cards when prices were cheap. Also, these cards are they don't need plug and play. All the resources are configured by Jumper. Address 220, interrupt 7, DMA1 is what you wanna use. And there are no drivers, nothing to initialize. The cards just work. In some games, you might need a set blaster environment variable, but that's about it. If you Google this model number, you will find this card referred to as the Sound Blaster 1.5 because there was a previous uh, revision of this card. I just call this the Sound Blaster and I think that's perfectly fine. A little bit later, Creative followed up with the Sound Blaster 2, model number CT1350B, revision 3 is the card I have. And yeah, firstly, it is a lot smaller. Creative liked to combine chips into a larger chip to drive costs down, uh, make the card more appealing to a wider range of consumers. Otherwise, it does the same thing as the uh, regular Sound Blaster. It's a little bit smaller, but there are a couple of technical differences. This one is the only Creative Labs sound card that requires a power supply with negative five volts, and that can be actually an issue. We will talk about how I get around that issue. Also, to upgrade this sound card with the Game Blaster, 
Creative uh, Music System standard, you need three chips. This third one used to be uh, very difficult uh, to copy or reverse engineer, but the community has succeeded. I might put a link down below in the description where you can buy a upgrade kit. So quite different. The FM sound does sound a little bit nicer. The CMS sound, in my opinion, sounds more raw and uh, a little bit more character. It also has stereo, which is very, very nice. And um, yeah, if your game has an option to play with Game Blaster sound, definitely check it out. Um, it does sound a little bit different and yeah, maybe even a bit more retro. To me personally, it is the FM sound because that's what I grew up with. I played all these games back in the day with FM. So to me, that sounds uh, most natural. And here we have the system I put together for this video. We have a 386 SX running at 33 megahertz, four megabytes of RAM and six ISA slots. A tip. If you're on the hunt for an old 386 or 486 motherboard and there's a battery um, on the main board and the photos are a little bit blurry, do not buy that product. Uh, ask the seller for high resolution close-up images around the battery area. If there's any sign of a leak and some acid flowing, do not buy this main board. Very likely it doesn't work anymore. Um, when I got this board, the battery was leaking a little bit, but it didn't quite reach the board. So I quickly unsoldered it and installed a replacement battery. And this is how I solved the power issue. So these main boards use the older AT standard and you have a choice. You can use an old power supply that has AT connectors. I recommend against that. I do not trust old power supplies. The voltages might be out of spec and you're risking several hundreds of dollars of vintage hardware. Uh, do yourself a favor, use a modern ATX power supply and get an adapter. So your ATX power supply connects into here and then into the main board. Make sure that the uh, four black wires are towards the center. It comes with a power switch, so you can turn the machine on and off. And this particular adapter has a voltage converter, and this is what supplies the negative five volts, which the Sound Blaster 2 requires. We need an IO controller. This is a Gold Star Prime 2, where we get ports for floppy and IDE. Pay attention to the pin number one. You need to line that up with your IDE ribbon cable. And this controller gives you also serial and parallel ports. There are usually jumpers on here to change the resources and uh, enable or disable certain features of this controller. Unfortunately, documentation is always an issue, so it can be a little bit of trial and error. And this is the video card we're using. It's a Tseng ET4000, very popular in the retro community. I have upgraded the memory to one megabyte. And uh, you might see this on the captures on modern LCD displays, these old ISA video cards. They can produce uh, vertical stripes, so you can see it on the image. That doesn't seem to be the case with a CRT monitor. So if you see that on your LCD monitor, um, yeah, don't worry too much about it. It's just the nature, unfortunately, best uh, to get an old CRT monitor if you can. Whenever I work with MS-DOS, I love using these GoTech floppy emulators. I use two versions. This is the one that plugs into your retro PC. It's got a standard floppy ribbon cable. Uh, make sure pin one connects, this is the red one here, connects to pin one on your IO controller. And also I recommend getting a second one. This one is the USB version. 
So this one plugs into your Windows 10, Linux or uh, Mac and then you've got a floppy drive. So this is basically a USB floppy drive. This is basically an internal floppy drive. You hold down both buttons while turning on the machine. It will format the floppy with, with uh, 1000 images and then you can navigate uh, from 0 to 999 on both of these GoTek controllers. So on the modern PC you just select your slot, copy the games across or your MS-DOS files and then you can use it on your retro PC. I will put links to these down below in the description. Uh, I highly recommend getting a GoTech. I had so many issues with real floppies. Not anymore. I think around 10 years ago I switched over to these and not a single issue so I always recommend getting one of them. We need some storage and you can go with a old school hard drive but they can be unreliable, noisy, also the performance is not that great. So we can use modern alternatives. You can go with compact flash or with an SD card. And the differences are performance, but for DOS that's really not an issue. These can go up to 133 megabytes a second. This one tops out around 20, 30, 40 megabytes per second. I can't remember exactly, but it's, it's, it's less than Compact Flash. But for DOS that is not an issue. They both will perform uh, absolutely beautifully. Um, the SD card adapters are a little bit more expensive, but the SD cards on the other hand are cheaper and easier to source. Here it's the opposite. The adapters are cheaper and easier to find because the Compact Flash standard is natively compatible with IDE, but finding CF cards these days a little bit harder. You might have to find a specialist store or order it online. Now let's have a chat about the big picture. Where do these sound cards sit in comparison with others? Well, they are definitely special, uh, 30 years old and yeah, vintage, retro, whatever you want to call it. They are definitely highly sought after, not easy to find and you will likely have to pay a couple hundred dollars to get one of them. So um, do they sound any different? Well. Whenever I listen to these Sound Blaster cards, maybe it's just imagination or it's my memory playing tricks, but they do sound warmer and they bring me uh, happy memories that other cards cannot uh, do. And that's because I grew up with these. I remember uh, working a couple of weeks on a building, on a construction site, saving up my money and I bought the Sound Blaster here and then uh, later I upgraded to the Sound Blaster 2. I believe it came with some games, Indiana, uh, Indianapolis 500, Lemmings and maybe something else as well. So um, yeah, definitely whenever I hear these cards, um, something inside me just uh, changes and that's a feeling that no other card can reproduce. So yeah, there's that. Now in terms of um, if you just look at the specs, uh, being Sound Blaster compatible and compatible with Adlib or OPL2, a lot of cards can do that. Um, if you're looking for something affordable, something like an ESS audio drive or uh, Yamaha or YMF are good alternatives. Of course there are heaps of Sound Blaster 16 cards out there and lots of other cards that are very uh, comparable. What I, I personally like about these cards is they do not have a, an audio mixer. That means the balance between uh, FM music and digital speech is sort of uh, set baked in stone and also the how should I put it, uh, the reference standard, whereas with a lot of other cards um, sometimes the, the speech is too loud or too soft or something like that, whereas here it just feels right, especially with the very old games. It's good to see that the community has uh, reverse engineered or copied this uh, third chip here and you can upgrade them to the Game Blaster standard. And that pretty much brings us to the end of this video. There's not much more to talk about. These sound cards are very straightforward. They're definitely collector's items. So I would like to hear what are your thoughts on these original Sound Blaster cards. Are you using them in your old 386 or 286 machine or have you decided to go with something from ESS or maybe a Yamaha YMF or Sound Blaster 16 or some other card. Um, there are lots of options to choose from and as always there is no perfect sound card. Every card has a weakness. I do like these cards for the simplicity, no MPU for one, no um, plug and play manager, no mixer, so they just work. And they're also a really good companion to use with an MPU for one card or maybe another sound card and then running an external mixer. So yeah guys, let me know what do you think. Share your thoughts, your happy memory stories down below. 
Also, with the retro, haven't done one of these videos in a long time. Let me know what it is you want to see. I do my best to make it happen. I've got a very busy life at the moment, so I do my best to uh, produce a video here and there. And yeah, if you found this video interesting, also for those who have subscribed recently, yes, I used to do a lot of retro videos and I still do them, not as often. So yeah. I do retro videos. Yeah, so if that's something you want to see, uh, don't be shy, let me know. I'll do my best to make it happen. Um, if you're new to the channel, hit that subscribe button to hang around, see some more content, and give it a like, share the video with your friends, and I shall see you soon with another one.